hello, I'm uh, Nathaniel Brooks. I'm a, a neurosurgeon at the University of Wisconsin. Hello, I'm Mike Steinmetz. I am uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. I am the chairman of the Department of Neurological Surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Here we're going to talk about uh, spine endoscopy um, and uh, kind of our, our thoughts about the advances in spine endoscopy and uh, its um, uh, more recent uh, uh, adoption within uh, the North America. So, hi Mike, uh, hey, nice Dan, to see nice you. Nice to see you. So, um, I think what we want to start with is that um, uh, spine endoscopy actually has been around quite a long time, uh, at least 20 years um, in various forms. Um, what do you think has happened more recently that's allowed it to become uh, more, more, more commonly used uh, and, and thought of as a, as a tool for spine surgery? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. I, I, and I think it's probably multiple factors, uh, probably at least three. I, I think one of the most significant is you pr we had largely the same endoscopes and tools for probably that 20 years which probably limited the application of, the, of these technologies. Um, now we've seen new companies enter the market. Mm -hmm. We've seen now R&D dollars put into developing newer endoscopes. They work better, They're, we have better tools. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really allowed um, you know, spine surgeons to apply this to a, a wider range of pathology. So I think that is one, is just entering the market with newer technologies improvements. Um, two is we've now seen a number of surgeons in bigger academic centers teaching this, right? It's really, it's really gained some traction in mainstream spine surgery. And it was just a little bit of a spark, and those people started training people. People catch on to, you know, other surgeons doing it. And I think we've seen that spread to some extent in bigger centers. And so there's more interest in mainstream spine surgery as well. And I think the third is now that the uh, technology is advanced, it's not just doing a simple transforaminal discectomy. Now we can do um, uh, fusion technologies or fusion procedures. And I think once you start merging endoscopy with now implants and the R&D dollars that sit with those companies, now I think that's even further broad in the exposure, uh, you know, of us with these, uh, you know, great, with these technologies. Great. But, but, you know, Than, you know, you, you have been one that has been an earlier adopter of this and mm -hmm. you've really, you know, used this in practice. How did you incorporate this into your practice? Like, what, 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 what did it take for you to bring this on, and what do you use this for commonly in your practice? Right. So, so I would tell you that that my kind of road to adoption, um, I think, I think really started uh, number one in in the realization from the neurosurgery side, we were using endoscopes all throughout the the the. Um, uh, the rest of the, the neuroaxis and the brain, we're using endoscopes. We've been doing that for years, um, and, and we'd also been using for more, more re readily now for skull-based surgeries. And so I felt like um, those are actually much more, uh, in, in some ways, more dangerous places to be using endoscopes. Um, and I also saw that there was, there was uh, definitely an, an improvement in the engineering and the technology mm -hmm. um, compared to the, the early days. Um, and, and the other thing was that the data started to come out, that there were randomized controlled trials demonstrating that there was benefit. And, and, and so I, I felt much more comfortable in the idea that, that as, I, as I brought on these techniques, that, I, that, that there was some evidence that they could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, so my road, um, maybe a bit different than yours, was really a, a, a road to like try to um, uh, learn the, the decompressive techniques, the tissue, tissue removal techniques, discectomies, those types of things, um, b just because those were going to be the bread and butter operations uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, of, of spine surgery. Um, and, and, then, and then have the skill set to do other things later on. And, yep. and so that, that's, that's essentially how I started. Um, and not to talk too long about it, but just so everybody kind of understands how, you, how I tell people to adopt these types of technologies is that um, I, I also, they also was a change in the, the, the available techniques. And so the interlaminar technique, which is uh, much more like our conventional uh, mm -hmm. open end uh, discectomy, um, really allowed me to feel more comfortable that I could work with an endoscope, if I didn't feel like I could complete the operation, that I could just convert it to a, a slightly larger open incision and then, and then take out the disc. As, that's, as and that's needed. a great point. It's a yeah. much more comfortable, familiar procedure and allows you to do that through an endoscope in a, in a familiar way before right. you start doing other techniques. That's great advice. And the, and the other part was, it was that um, the indications for that, for that procedure are much, very much the same yeah. as the indications that we, that, that we typically see for, for um, an open procedure, Correct. so it wasn't. It, I didn't have to. Didn't have to because, <clears throat> again, you know, although I, I w was able to train with people that have done quite a bit of this, 
uh, in cadaver courses and to those types of things as far as understanding the indications and, and, and what, the, what the scope could actually do. I was essentially kind of a little bit on my own um, and then of course my, my uh, senior partners and, and, and other people in my, in my community are going to be watching the results Correct. and so, so I wanted to make sure that I had a way to make sure the results would still be good uh, and, and good of course point. for the patients as, yeah. as well. So, Excellent point. Yeah. So, 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 Mike, I, I think that there, there's also, um, in, as we look at endoscopy, uh, there's, there are, um, uh, we would say, like, uh, adaptive or enabling in t technologies that might help people do more with an endoscope than, than, uh, than, than we kind of think about right now, which is uh, um, flu fluoroscopy-based types of things. Are there any, do you have any thoughts on that subject? Are there any things that you've done or tried that... that can help that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. So there's still some discomfort, I think, in tra with traditional spine surgeons of accessing the spine endoscopically, right? We need a lot of fluoroscopy. We're going transforaminally often into Kamen's triangle. That's not an area where many people were trained, and now we're training people now. Right. Um, and so what I think the two things that will probably advance our ability to do this probably safer in a more comfortable way would be one, merging endoscopy with you know, na navigation. Right. And I know you've done some of this already, right? We can uh, use our endoscopes and our portals with current navigation, right. um, but this will probably continue to advance you know, as, uh, um, as uh, imaging companies see the advantages and largely implant companies, again, probably through the fusion route, uh, as they start helping us merge endoscopy with navigation safer, more comfortable, I think. But I think the biggest advance, perhaps, uh, that may help us is robotics. Um, again, we're all still a little bit unclear where does a robot fit in our operating room, what it's gonna help us with. But I think, again, getting us a safe corridor to the spine with a robot and then, and then developing the skills to work through there endoscopically, I think will really change right. uh, and really advance this. Right. Uh, and as things that you've brought up, you know, again, can we use you know, ultrasound or other enabling technologies to be able to do that? Yeah, so, so I, I, I totally agree with you. Navigation uh, had, had allowed me to kind of jump, jump into doing things that probably are more technically difficult, uh, slightly bit quicker than I think I would have been able to had I just been fluoroscopy based. And, yeah particularly that was uh, uh, um, dealing with, with scoliosis and adjacent sigma degeneration and, uh, and, and foraminal stenosis in the setting of scoliosis, those types of cases um, where, where, uh, um, where using fluoroscopy is a little bit more, more challenging. challenging. Um, and so um, I definitely found that as to be helpful. Of course, not everybody has access to that. So I think, I think your point about the companies uh, identifying that as having a role and bringing down the costs of it so that people can, can, can use it more Too readily is gonna be important. Hey, Thanda, one, one maybe closing question for you, uh, you as being someone who's out there teaching this, is what do you think is going to need to change so that we can have a broader exposure to trainees to this? Are we going to be able to do this in our traditional training programs? Do we need to set up more satellite? You know, what are your thoughts on training for this so, operation? So there's, I have a, a, quite a few thoughts on this because the, the, the biggest uh, barrier to entry, I think, for endoscopy, number one is understanding the indications and what the scopes can do. Um, and number two is, is learning the skills to do it because they're very separate from what we t do in open surgery. Um, and even, from, even if a, a neurosurgeon who's done a lot of uh, intracranial endoscopy, it, the tools are so different that, that right. you have to learn these skills. Um, and so, and so uh, what, what, um, what, we, what I've tried to do in my program is, is provide um, uh, very much a similar situation to what general surgery did, which is, which is simple box trainers that people can start the process and oh, they very use very nice. inexpensive mm -hmm. uh, um, endoscopes that you can buy off of Amazon to, to learn wow. on. Um, and, and so those are, that's kind of like a, a way to get your hands uh, used to the skills, mm -hmm. used to the visualization, used to how the tools move, um, and then eventually working into cadavers and, and those types of things. But I definitely uh, see um, uh, that the the other difference is that um, f for the most part we have we have people that are already f uh, attending level um, or, or faculty surgeons trying to learn how to do this mm -hmm. and that that's a hard time 
a harder time to learn because you're basically you're, you're trying to speed up the process That's of learning. Okay. Uh, whereas when when I'm teaching residents and fellows, they, they don't have to rush through anything. So if they're working through the the exposure part uh, of a case, which is very minimal, but uh, you know working on on uh, is a relatively safe area to be working mm -hmm. in. Um, they can take their time with it, and then they can step away, and I can do the part that's a little bit more uh, d demanding or unsafe, and then and then they'll get their they'll get their uh, um, uh, their skills uh, up uh, in that way. Um, and so I think I think it will change as it as it's um, in you know in a uh, uh, you know a, a, a training program setting, um, and much in the same way that MIS uh, laterals um, uh, tubular cases. Um, you know, when, when it was first coming on, it was, it was really attending level uh, folks trying to learn how to do right. it, and that was a different, different style, but now our residents and fellows come out and they, they say, what's the difference between tube and open Correct. for them? It's, it's an easy, straightforward thing. Yep. So, good advice. Yeah. Good thought. So, so thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, I Dan. appreciate taking the time. My great. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.